So I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are crucial to our success. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca Bryant, who is going to say a few words to situate this and then also introduce our speaker. So take it away, Rebecca. All right. Thanks, Marilee. I want to uh, draw attention to the fact that today's webinar is also part of a series of webinars we've been offering that relate to cross-campus collaboration or uh, what we're calling social interoperability and research support. Uh, so we've had several uh, throughout last fall and now coming into the spring that are really talking about case studies such as the University of Miami's embedding librarians on interdisciplinary research teams or funding a shared GIS position at Rutgers or supporting bibliographic and research impact analysis at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so what you're going to be hearing today is, is just another presentation sort of in that series that I think will also be really useful in thinking about the synergies that need to happen across campus in order for us to be successful in developing research support services. This uh, is sort of underpinned and related to a recent publication from OCLC Research that I co-authored with Brian Lavoy and Annette Dortmund, and that was published uh, last August. And our goal with this was to really emphasize that it's beyond technical interoperability. We must have what we call social interoperability to be successful in research support efforts like research data management, ORCID adoption, research information management, uh, bibliometrics, and research impact support. So uh, this report uh, examines uh, those challenges and offers a model for understanding who the stakeholders are and some advice on how to build those relationships. But today you're going to hear from Illinois and Arizona about their case studies, about how they've done that successfully. And now I'm going to turn it over to Heidi Imker to talk about Illinois. All right, thank you very much, uh, Re Rebecca, for that nice introduction and situating the, the scenario for us here. Uh, like, like I said, thanks for everybody to, to, for coming today. And I'm Heidi Imker at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and our OCLC hosts uh, really encouraged me to talk about our collaboration with the research office in terms of how it um, helped us establish the research data service and also fund it. And then, of course, the collaborations that have happened going forward. So just kind of a note, our uh, research office sits within the chancellor's um, area. So it's actually the office of the vice chancellor for research. Uh, most re recently, it also became for innovation, but in the context of the history for this talk, um, it was just the vice chancellor of research. And uh, so I'll refer to it as OVCR. So I've uh, separated this talk out into two parts. The first is the collaborations that happen in order to fund the research data service. And I'll say right up front, all of this happened before I came into my role. So uh, everybody else has a has a whole uh, lot of credit that they are deserving for the immense amount of work that went into that. Um, and then the second part, I'll talk about um, how we've maintained those collaborations um, since the research data service began. So when people do talk to me about this or ask about it, the way that I usually describe it um, is that it was really a cross between um, preparation and timing in order to um, be able to get the funding for our research uh, data service. So we have been very fortunate and fairly unique in the fact that uh, the entire uh, funds that for our program came from uh, central administration. So that's why it's particularly special. So uh, one of the things uh, that I tend to think about with this is that um, preparation is mostly within your control, so um, within the, the group of people, in terms of what you can have the bandwidth for preparing anyway. Um, the timing is a little bit more, more difficult in terms of it's out of your control. You're not sure when it'll happen. Um, you're not sure when that opportunity will present itself. But you also know that, that it will happen at some point because of the way that universities work, um, there's always some amount of um, turnover and change in um, the sort of uh, strategic priorities and, and interests. 
So you know it'll happen, you just don't necessarily know when. So for us, I'll, I'll talk, just give you a little kind of a brief timeline then. Our research data service formally was established in 2014. And so there were several years prior to that where there was a lot of activity building up to it. And a lot of that really started, began with um, uh, an effort on campus that was really related to IT. And it was called the Stewarding Excellence at uh, Illinois IT. There was a um, committee and then a report that came out of that. It had a whole slew of different um, sectors of IT that they were really interested in, but one of it was really about research data. And so from that report came uh, uh, an initiative that lasted um, through an academic year, ultimately led to a proposal, and then the RES becoming part of the strategic plan. So on the top half of this year, that top half of the arrow, it's really, these are the things that happened really central to Illinois and were, you know, largely in a lot of a lot of ways um, able to be you know, controlled the preparation that was done uh, on behalf of the on, on behalf of establishing the research data service. The things uh, below were, were sort of these external factors that that happened um, you know outside of our control, but we knew they would be coming. So, for example, the NSF DMP requirement um, became a, a reality in 2011. We did, in fact, get a new vice chancellor for research in uh, 2012. And then, as these things were happening, you know. Um, there was continued momentum, for example, the OSTP memo then in 2013. So in terms of why our campus, um, you know, had this as part of the, the um, you know, research IT or IT um, uh, uh, stewarding excellence and why would the, this was on radars at all was a lot of it had to do with the sort of what I call gravity of government policy. And this is everybody's favorite slide because people really can identify with it. But, you know, what happens is that there's some sort of federal policies and those go down to the federal funding agencies, the directives to them. They have to figure out what to do with it. So they give directives to the institutions. They then have to figure out what to do with it. So then there's a directive to a principal investigator. So, you know, depending on what the policy is, maybe it ends there and it, it just becomes the principal investigator's responsibility. But for data and data management, data stewardship, a lot of that, you know, goes down another layer to individual researchers who might be graduate students or postdocs. Um, or other sorts of research staff. So this can leave someone who's, you know, at kind of the end of this hill with a lot of confusion in terms of what they can actually do. So the idea really was that um, we needed to be able to address this proactively. So within this report, um, there, the specific section about uh, uh, research data initiative was acknowledged up front that there was unlikely to be any kind of cost savings related to any of the efforts around this. But they also felt like there was a lot of risk if we weren't more proactive in how we steward and manage research data. So they recommended two different things. One was to establish a working group um, to develop a roadmap for data stewardship. And the second was to begin coordinating those services uh, around de development of data management plans and or data sharing plans, you know, precisely as I was talking about on the, on the um, previous slide. So out of this then, this uh, roadmap, there became a, a committee, it was called the Data Stewardship Committee, and this had um, several key stakeholders on campus. So uh, several people from the University Library, several people from the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, also representation from our supercomputing center, our certainly our, our central campus IT, our graduate college, and um, our iSchool. And so and in general, in all of these, in all of these, um, groups were particularly um, very you know influential administrative high level administrative um, people who had quite a bit of quite a bit of uh, sway i'll just give you a little note here for um the supercomputing representative that we happened his name is john towns if any of you happens to know him but um he's had a whole bunch of different roles and uh, has been really instrumental in supercomputing resources so he's just sort of a big wig there wasn't really a specific element there um, and the same thing for our graduate college. We just had somebody who um, was you know, really in tune with the needs um, on, the, on, the, on the campus for the graduate students there. So anytime you put any any uh, you know slide like this together, and there's um, you know a, a number of people or a number of organizations, there's always maybe some sort of implied hierarchy about you know who is more important or whatever. Um, but in the in the vein of Love Your Data Week, uh, this was actually very deliberately. Uh, presented in this way so that I could fill out a nice heart because it was basically the data love committee uh, and these were all uh, organizations and our units on our campus that were very interested in um, how to how to give some more love to our data. So this this committee uh, came forward uh, and one of the things that they did was they established this initiative it was also called the year of data stewardship 
Um, and this was in the 2011 and 2012 academic year. Um, and I didn't go anything specific about who was invited, but basically they had a series of um, high profile events with, um, you know, real leaders in this area that came to campus to help, um, you know, kind of, you know, give the sort of a groundswell of interest and really socialize the, the, the interest in uh, data, set, data stewardship and data management. So, for example, um, you know, a VP of a, of a university, some several very prominent um, experts in areas, so, you know, citizen science, digital preservation, and, um, and information um, science thought leader. So, this really helped to establish it as really something that was quite um, imperative for the campus to do. There was a lot of energy and enthusiasm around it. So, this led then to uh, a, a proposal. So, a uh, proposal to the campus. Um, basically an ask to launch a research data service. And what they did within the proposal was propose a hybrid model where there would be a set of core services, but they would leverage existing research infrastructure. So being very cognizant to not duplicate any other services or infrastructure that already existed on campus. So that's also part of the reason why that committee had representations from so many different parts of campus so that we would be able to do that. The general um, ideas of what this service would do then would be to have um, data curation and technical professionals and with oversight by the director. We would implement uh, data storage services, data processes, provide consultations, work closely with all these um, central service units, and then interact with various government gov governance groups um, on our campus. So that was the ask. And even more specifically, um, the ask included eight FTEs, so a director, two data curation specialists, another data curation specialist exclusively for sensitive data, uh, and then uh, a developer for um, basically front-end development and any kind of tools or workflows, uh, a repository developer, and then two um, sys administrators for storage. And then additional to this would be um, other resource needed, for example, for member sites, for, for data site or ORCID, and then of, of course, any kind of hardware or software um, licensing or, or procurement that would need to happen. So this, uh, was $800,000 a year. So that was what the ask to campus was. And um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, we didn't quite get that, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about why I think we were, the campus was successful at all. Um, and, and in a, a continuation of Love Your Data Week, I, I'll say really explicitly what each one of these groups, these units on campus, had to love about this pro pro proposal. You know, what was really in it for them? What did they love about it? So for the library, of course, um, we're very interested in data curation and preservation. These are important scholarly objects. Uh, it's you know, directly within our mission and interest. The OBCR um, thought about it from a little bit of a different perspective. Certainly they were concerned about compliance with new mandates um, and also for the data management data management plan requirement, and also just general research support. You know, they really want the researchers on our campus to have um, all the support that they need to be successful. Um, so that was their interest there. Our IT unit was really particularly interested in storage. So at this time period, you know, cloud infrastructure was just coming online. You know, we did have Box, um, but we also still had a lot of very, um, you know, physical storage mechanisms. AWS wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't, or excuse me, Amazon Web Services was not uh, quite up up there at that point. So physical storage was actually a really, really big deal for our, our IT department. Our supercomputing center is a bit of an interesting scenario where, um, you know, certainly they were interested in the infrastructure that would come along, but I also got the real sense that they were interested in the awareness around the value of data. So certainly being um, a supercomputing center, they rely on data and it's core to um, feed, uh, you know, the, the sorts of activities that they do. So they had kind of this interesting um, interest in it kind of twofold. Our graduate college just was particularly interested in being able to support our graduate students and our postdocs as they're doing their research. I think anybody who has um, worked in a, in a graduate college probably has had, you know, many encounters with um, very forlorn uh, students who are struggling with their thesis because of, you know, some uh, data management mishap. So again, this is um, kind of similar to the OBCR in terms of really wanting to provide that support. And then finally, our dean of the iSchool, our information science school was interested because data curation and these, you know, stewardship uh, issues are, are really core to the LIS professional pathway. So they were interested in it from, from that perspective. So this is almost the last of the hearts, I promise, but I just wanted to um, show how much love there was for this sort of initiative on our campus. Um, and it was in fact um, successful. So let me go back to this just for a moment then. 
and kind of reiterate. So, you know, I talked a lot about the preparation. So this committee had done a ton of work to these activities, put this really, you know, thoughtful proposal together. And then it came to the point of timing, and this is where, you know, something came in that was very important. So they had done this work through the 2011-12 academic year, and we happened to get a new vice chancellor of research. This is Peter Schiffer, um, who was actively interested in uh, this area. And I think, I think that RDS proposal was on his desk, you know, basically day one. So it was a really good um, matching of that sort of timing and the interest um, and the preparation that had, had come along prior to that. So for anybody who's had done this kind of work and maybe feels a little bit discouraged in terms of um, where where they can go and where, where it can go in the future or what kind of legs it might have, um, there there are these opportunities and sometimes it takes a little bit of patience. And some, in this case, awfully, awfully good timing. So what did we get? Okay, we didn't get $800,000 a year, but we did get $400,000 of permanent reoccurring funding. So, you know, it's kind of a sale. Um, but it also, in some ways, really helped us focus on um, what our research data service would do. So instead of a FTE, we ended up with four. So me as the director, the two data curation specialists, and um, really the repository infrastructure, so a developer for that. I can talk later if anybody was interested or if you want to email me what happened with the storage components of that, because that's um, uh, something did happen, but it was not a reoccurring um, funding. So, But I won't necessarily focus on that for right now. And then we also did receive um, resources for um, our memberships, memberships that were important, and then the, uh, the uh, hardware and, and software licensing that we needed. So all of that happened prior to me coming into my role as the director of the research data service. So they um, had done all this work. They 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 got this funding. This is how I was hired. So from there on out, it was really just up to me to not mess it up. So we had established this really wonderful relationship, and you know, for, from from there on out, it was really about maintaining that relationship. So just like any other collaboration, there are you know some just you know few basic tenets. So you know, really understanding your um, your collaborators' needs are going to be different than yours, so being respectful of their time. They're incredibly, you know, busy administrators, always, you know, expecting or respecting their um, expertise and understanding what their pressures are. So, you know, we have a very um, distinct um, interest in open access and um, open resources, open science, open data. Um, and it's not that they don't necessarily, um, you know, believe in that at all, but it isn't necessarily also either their, their particular pressure or their motivation, so being really cognizant of that. And then, of course, you need to understand what your needs are. So, you know, respect is reciprocal. But from there, also just being trying to be as uh, helpful wherever we can and being able to pitch into anything and everything that's been related to, to data is, I think, one of the ways which we've been able to um, maintain that relationship. So just a few things about what our research data service does then. So um, we do have these four people. It has shifted around in the last several years in terms of what those roles are. So I'm still the director, but then we have uh, an associate director who's in charge of all our curation and our data repository. She does a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, and actually we have a brand new position that's coming in, um, which is a research data support librarian. So this is a faculty role at the University of, of Illinois Library. Um, tenure track position. We're very, very excited um, in order to, to be able to move forward with this. Um, the job posting isn't out yet, but um, please email me and keep an eye out for it. You know, if you're interested or you know somebody's interested, um, well, Illinois is, is terrific. We have a really great group and um, quite nice to live here, actually. And then, of course, we have our repository developer who's been us, um, with us since the beginning, who's also terrific. So the things that we do um, should look familiar to most of you. So we know uh, data policies, resources, best practices. Um, that's part of our, our mandate. We consult on data, data management planning and implementation, and we review those data management plans. We also teach data management, documentation, and data publishing, and then we publish research in um, our uh, data repository called the Illinois Data Bank, um, which we developed and operated um, on the Urbana-Champaign campus. So how has this really worked in practice then? So why does the research office um, come to us and why do we go to the to research administration? Um, so the reason why we reach out to research administration is you know, kind of some of these uh, things here. One is just basic updates. I consider them kind of like a dotted line reporting or even almost a funder because they were a funder. So um, keeping them up to date on what's happening within the research data service, um, you know, even down to just like, hey, these are these are our staffing issues. You know, we're, we're having turnover. We'd like to make the position more attractive. So we'd like a faculty position, for example. 
So, but otherwise, just an uptake, how things are going, um, different initiatives, and you know, success stories is a, is a really important thing to share with them. We also are sure to go to them with um, opportunities of interest. For example, um, here in the States, when the APLU AAU began their data sharing um, symposium and workshops, um, we saw this as something that would be really beneficial for our campus to participate in. Um, and so we, we went to them to, to, um, uh, to support uh, the, our, our participation in that. We also get them heads up on just sort of changes or challenges that we see coming in the future. So when NIH did their final, um, final policy release, for their data management and sharing um, policy in October, you know we were we were on it and we're sure to um, kind of distill the bullet points and forward that on to them um, to begin that sort of um, outreach and, and, and awareness. It's also come up in terms of, for example, data transfer agreements, which we've seen um, a pretty um, significant uptick uh, in requests for in the last year or so. Our unit itself doesn't um, doesn't manage those. It, it goes to our grant and contracts office. But just them knowing the amount of interest that we're seeing, particularly for more sensitive uh, data sets that um, can't just be publicly released, um, is, is something that we're seeing. We also go to them for kind of more um, you know sensitive things like deconvolution. You know, this thing is happening on this campus, but I, then I saw this over thing is happening too. And you know, what's going on with that? Or or you know, are these complementary? Or you know, is, is it planning on merging, you know, just sorts of all sorts of scenarios that I think most of you are familiar with on, on your own campus. Also go to them for referrals. Hey, we met this person uh, and we can't figure out what, you know, resource we might have available to them. You know of anything. So we certainly do that. And then we go to them to um, ask for, you know, to support uh, initiatives and also to communicate them. So if we have something new um, that we're starting or even to just um, keep the promotion of the services that we do have um, kind of at the forefront of their own communication strategies. Um, we're, we're sure to, to send along um, nice um, uh, uh, um, communication materials for them for them to be able to incorporate language and, and, and such. So then why do they come to us? So what's their what's their collaborative interest in us? Well obviously it's for the, the service areas. So um, as I listed on the on the other slide there, so you know we we uphold all of our obligations to be the experts in those areas. They also ask us to be um, committee representation um, on and off campus. So if we have a data governance committee on campus, um, for example, um, but also, uh, for example, being on the um, APLU AAU um, data sharing committee is, is another example, something that's, that's off campus. Anything that's related to data and open. So, and this can end up being a lot of different things, as many of you know. Um, so certainly open data, but then also bleeding into open science and then data science are all things that we've been involved in and they've asked us um, to participate in. Similarly, they come to us for referrals or like, hey, we need somebody to, to talk on the radio about predatory publishing. Who should we contact? I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly has her own podcast and she knows all about that. You know, contact Kelly so we can give those, those sorts of um, referrals to them. Um, and then coordinating and drafting requests for information, particularly anything that's related around open access and data, um, for example, from OSPP or NIH, uh, those sorts of places. And then we also provide a mechanism for to support their uh, initiatives and their communications. So, you know, we get contacted about, hey, this thing is happening from our um, from our central office. Can you promote it? And, you know, we're, we're happy to do that. And it's um, a great reciprocal relationship in that regard as well. So why why maintain this collaboration? I mean, in some ways, this is um, you know obvious and in, in why it's, it's so important to us. But just in thinking about it, these are sort of the specific things that I think about are that we really are important to us. And I don't think we would get it from our collaboration necessarily in, in with any other um, any other unit uh, on campus. One is that because they are such a central uh, area and all research sort of falls into them. It's really good at keeping us grounded in terms of what the priorities are and what the pressures are and um, keeps us from being too much in a, in a little bit of a bubble uh, around, uh, you know, what we might think are the, the most um, pressing issues entirely. So that, that keeping us, kind of keeping us real is, is really important. Also is really particularly good in keeping us in the loop. So you know, when we had um, some different sorts of data science initiatives and I just got an email really this morning about, hey, this thing is happening on campus. I really want you to be involved. And so um, that having that kind of bridge or that um, letter of introduction, you might say, um, has been really terrific and, and helping us be uh, so, um, so broadly engaged with the campus. And then sort of kind of to those communication 
um, messaging that I, I said on the last few slides, it keeps us visible. So we're on the tip of their tongue, they're aware of us, you know, we get referrals from them um, all the time um, and it helps to also make sure that um, it, it's known that it's also a campus ad administration priority um, and not just a, a library priority, for example. And then last is just they're really terrific colleagues. They um, are just, they're problem solvers. You can go to them with anything. Um, and and try to puzzle through things and you know they know the ins and outs and they're always just really really terrific to work with I just I really appreciate them um, as, as colleagues and how they approach things um, in such a um, helpful way very similar to, to you know library uh, the library ethos so so that's really uh, it so uh, thank you very much for your time and attention and I promised earlier on that I would um, acknowledge people who really deserved quite a bit of credit. Um, for forming this relationship early on with our research office. Um, and that is Beth Namachavaya, who uh, is currently the UL at Waterloo. So she really led a lot of this and was um, absolutely key. I actually joked with Rebecca that um, she probably should have given this talk um, rather rather than I, but Beth was, Beth was amazing. Also Sarah Shreves, now at Arizona, was instrumental, um, a huge, a huge force and, and energy behind it as well. And then uh, Bill Michaud, who is the head of our engineering, our Granger Engineering uh, Library, who is also very, um, very active and key in, in those relationships. Our website is research data service at illinois.edu. We're actually in the middle of doing a, a website uh, refresh, as probably everybody in the world is, but um, uh, feel free to visit and take a look at our things. And then again, if you have any any questions, of course, if you want to want to or have any interest in our new position, please email me. But if you have any questions just in general about the work that we've done or how we've handled things, um, I'm infer at uh, illinois.edu, and I would be happy to to talk with you. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, we're going to hold questions and uh, pass on directly to the folks at University of, of Arizona to share their story next. Okay, great. Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'll be starting our presentation on partnering with the Office of Research, Innovation, and Impact on RDM Services, the University of Arizona experience. And I'll be doing half the presentation and then Fernando will be finishing up. So we have, have had quite an evolution in our services, and so I developed this graphic to give everybody a sense of what our journey has been. So back in 2011, uh, when the um, requirements from NSF came out, um, the data curation librarian was appointed, and uh, when that happened, um, I joined the Data Management Advisory Committee that had already started doing their work. And then um, once the um, committee came out with a recommendation, um, there was a standing committee that was appointed, and we started doing open data programming. One of the first um, activities that the committee did was we conducted an RDM survey in 2014. and um, as part of that, we um, decided that it was important to do, um, to get sort of more detailed information. So uh, we had a data management data creation pilot. Um, and in 2017, our RDM specialist was hired, who is Fernando. And um, now that we had more um, staff, we were able to expand our workshop offerings. We implemented the Open Science Framework the following year. And more recently, um, we applied for and were um, funded um, the implementation of the data repository, and we hired additional staff. And now our data repository is open, available to campus. And so now, um, going forward, our journey continues. So going into more detail on uh, what I mentioned as part of the graphic, um, the um, after the data creation librarian who um, with me was appointed um, and joined the Campus Data Management and Curation Advisory Committee, what came out of um, that committee was that we recommended that the libraries collaborate with Office of Research, Discovery, and Innovation 
in order to provide an integrated point of service. So the idea was that they would come to the library first um, for with any data management questions, and then we'd refer them to um, relevant people on campus if it wasn't something that we could directly answer. Our IT campus, IT department, um, in collaboration with the libraries and the Office of Research would develop a long-term long -term strategy to address data storage, data access, and data preservation. And in addition, um, one of the recommendations was also to establish an ongoing campus committee that, that would um, take a look at institutional support for data management and also um, would develop recommendations for ongoing data management services. At that time, we also implemented the DMP tool and we developed our website. The um, <clears throat> data management survey, one of the first things that the new data management committee did was we sent out a survey to faculty, researchers, and postdocs and grad students in 2014. And um, our purpose was we wanted to discover what um, RDM and creation needs were of the campus committee. And as a result of, of um, the survey, um, what we found were prime interests were um, a campus data repository. So that, that came out early as um, a stated need by um, campus. Also, um, data storage and um, data storage tools. So. Data storage, not for actually sharing data, but a place to store their data. And also help with any data storage tools, um, such as, as, like we were thinking at the time, Open Refine and Qualanon. <clears throat> Preservation was all so stated as being important, so um, um, being able to manage research files to um, um, lengthen the lifespan and, and to um, deal with uh, file obsolescence to help um, faculty with data documentation and metadata, and then also <clears throat> of prime interest was how to deal with confidentiality and legal issues. So <clears throat> compliance issues that are related to IRB to HIPAA to FERPA um, copyright and ITAR or export control. And one of the things that came out 
as part of the survey was we felt like we needed more detailed information. So we wanted to explore what uh, research data management needs were in more detail. And so we developed the data management and data creation pilot project. Um, the, um, the campus data management um, committee was actually a subcommittee and it was part of the actual, I'm sorry, I caught the name wrong. It's Research um, Computing Governance Committee. Um, and they overwhelmingly supported um, doing a pilot, and we were also funded by our sponsors. So the sponsors were the library, the Office of Research, and the Campus IT Department. We worked with um, RDI, the Office of Research in the whole application process. They had a whole system in place that really um, helped as we um, put, um, started advertising that we were looking for faculty members to be part of this pilot. And we were in interested in um, participants that came from a variety of disciplines and that were um, working at different stages of the research life cycle. So these are um, the different, er different disciplines that participated, that had faculty that participated as part of the pilot. So um, we had somebody from entomology, engineering education, Education, wildlife biology, cancer research, and public health. The results of the pilot resulted in um, a final report, and we did presentations to CG and the libraries. Our recommendations, which were a jumping off point to new services that um, we've either investigated or developed to implement open science framework for institutions to implement and develop a campus data repository. We felt that it would to coordinate and research data management services with the Office of Research, um, specifically to the units that we worked with were sponsored projects and research development services and to coordinate how we reach to campus with services that we are related to data so that the Office of Research does. We also thought it was really important to expand what we're offering for graduate students and postdocs. Doing more training for data science, um, I had done some of that in the past and we felt that um, there still was more training that needed to be done. Um, we wanted to develop online tutorials so we do, um, people could easily just pull up one of the tutorials that would need to wait for the next workshop that we're developing. And we're also investigating electronic lab notebooks. And some of the continuing development collaboration that happened at about that time, the research data management specialist hired in 2017. As a result of the Office of Science and Technology Policy Memo that came out in 2013, um, I think it was probably about a year a bit after that memo came out, uh, we established a public access group. And so it consisted of people from the library, from um, the Office of Research, which is now called, the, that office is now called Research, Innovation, and Impact, to um, the agency policies for public access. So the idea was that we wanted to, based on the po new policies that were coming out from federal agencies that provided research funding to um, have some um, provide guidance, but we need to be really powerful and data requirements. I'm focusing on the agencies that the University of Arizona receives more support from. 
There was also an oh, it was formed by um, office research. So that we had a representation that launch program research and the task force was formed by, um, initiated by one of the um, assistant vice presidents for research. And I'm going to go. Great. Thanks, Dr. Justin. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, we launched our data management website. And at that time, we reached out to the National Institute of Education. So we have done some American engineers on some of the other research that was at the run. I'll just tell you when I was there. I think there are a few times that I've had some pointers back to our website. But that was as of implementing those decisions. And uh, I'll get directly work with Python. Um, they have partners in that. You can help us get the word out. And uh, yes, that's a great team. And we use the OSF. Uh, and finally, just uh, last year, we started our team. I'll talk about this in the next slide. But as you can imagine, ReachDrop is an important partner here. So, very really like Chris, uh, we've been funded uh, from the provost office for the first few years. And because of this strategic importance at the campus level, we work out with the research office. This is something we various compliance arms uh, as, we, as we develop this service. So, early on, both uh, the human subjects program, the native people's services office, animal care, uh, and the transfer office, um, and health additional offices like the office of the general counsel and the practice management. Um, to work with them, and what we did was set up consultations. They provided us with some really good feedback, which, which um, I think really helped inform our policy. So, because these offices were only policy and commerce, we immediately just had to be very you know, around the journey of the country. Next slide. Uh, there are one of those is um, so like um, like Heidi mentioned in her presentation, we've also worked with our research office to respond to the various uh, requests for for comment from from federal funders. Um, uh, we did, uh, for example, uh, respond to the NIH uh, data management plan uh, policy uh, request for comment, uh, but there were others as well. Uh, we were um, we invited uh, inv were invited to consult for an internal project that's funded by, by the Office of Research, uh, and it's an it's a, a initiative that they're that they're uh, coordinating related to investigating and mitigating risks related to campus reentry after our campus closed last spring due to the pandemic. Um, we've also been regular presenters in. The responsible conduct of research program that the research office runs, and we've participated in that for the, the last few years. We also work with other university units that have close ties to the research office. Uh, for example, the Data Science Institute, um, Cybers, which is a, 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 a cyber infrastructure uh, that's uh, housed at the U of A, and, and also the University of IT, which runs a high performance computing cluster. And then finally, the libraries themselves, we've run several data-related programs, uh, such as uh, this data grant program, which is uh, a program that research, researchers can apply to and get money to purchase data sets uh, that they need for their research. And the idea is then that those data sets would be made available to the rest of campus. We also run a data visualization challenge um, for undergrad and graduate students. And the research office here has been helpful in, in helping us get the word out. Next slide, please. So, so what things are on the horizon for us then? So first, when it comes to the sustainability of the data repository, uh, the research office you know, is not only an important partner for the promotion of the repository, but also we see them as a long-term um, a partner for long-term funding. So what we're, we're pursuing here with them, uh, what we would like to pursue is a, a jointly funded model um, uh, for, for this particular service. So uh, you know, getting back to the, the NIH uh, DMP requirements, uh, some of you might have seen that they uh, were finally released towards the end of last year. And we see the research office uh, as an important partner in actually implementing and uh, helping researchers, researchers comply with, with those new requirements. So we plan to engage with them happily as, as uh, we move forward with that. Uh, one initiative that I want to highlight that's still pretty green, but uh, is one where the research office will play a critical role, is we're currently working with uh, colleagues at other Arizona's other research universities, uh, those being at Arizona State University, and Northern Arizona University. The draft uh, a research data policy at kind of this higher, higher tri-university level. And we plan to engage with them, uh, with, a, with the research office, at, not only at our institution, but across the institutions, 
uh, on this initiative because without their support, this initiative really will not succeed. Next slide. So a couple of concluding thoughts here. So it's pretty clear that the, the data services are pretty deeply tied to the mission of the research office. Um, and because the library provides a lot of data services as well, uh, the partnership makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we, we tend to provide uh, complementary services to, to them. Um, uh, so, so, you know, those ties make a lot of sense, but uh, at least at the U of A, the coupling remains, you know, kind of, kind of loose. Uh, and this gives us uh, some agility, but at the same time, uh, that comes at a cost uh, of, you know, it takes, takes more effort, takes effort to maintain these relationships. And uh, what we found is um, often that, that effort tends to come, come from us, from the libraries. Uh, kind of along those uh, same, uh, along the same vein, um, you know, the pandemic has made it harder to grab the attention of our colleagues over at the research office. And, you know, understandably so. Uh, like Heidi mentioned, they, they have different pressures the, the, than we do. So, uh, you know, that the, the, the handling the COVID situation has definitely uh, taken up uh, people's uh, uh, bandwidth there. Uh, we have found, though, that doing outreach in other areas has helped us keep those, those, those uh, help, has helped us keep um, uh, the library in the mind of uh, our collaborators over in the Office of Research. So uh, one example of that is um, Chris and I have presented a, a couple of times to the campus level associate deans of research group on, on some of, of our various initiatives. And we feel that's helpful uh, because, you know, with eventually that information will filter over to, to our colleagues over in the Office of Research. And it's always helpful for people to hear about what we're doing from different avenues that, that's not directly from us. So uh, then to sum up, I do think that the effort that we put into building and maintaining those relationships has paid dividends. And I think this is demonstrated by the fact that, you know, we consider uh, some of these individuals that are in, in leadership roles or in the research office as we consider them as friends of the library. Um, and, and some examples of, of the ones that we work with the most are the VP of Research Operations, the VP of Research Intelligence, and the Assistant VP of Research, de research Development. So with that, uh, I think I will wrap up. Um, I think that's the last slide. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Okay, I guess I'll step in. Uh, this is Rebecca to field some questions. Anything else from you, Marilee? Uh, no, I was just going to um, hand things off to you. I see that we have a couple of questions um, in the queue. Uh, and But if you do have any questions that you've been holding on to, now is the time to put them in the chat. Be, just be sure that the uh, option is set to everyone. Okay. So we're going to start with the first question that came from Monica McCormick, and she said she would love to hear a bit more about the way that Illinois' um, Data Stewardship Committee, how that led to the ask, uh, and um, what, did the, what did the committee members know? Did they know what the issues were as they got started? Did, did they learn as they went? Uh, and I think uh, if I can also sort of add this, you know, because we have I also got a question, you know, for Arizona as they're preparing for their ask, for their longer-term sustained ask, if you have any comments on that as well. So let's start with Heidi uh, on that question for Monica. Thanks, Thanks for that, that question. So um, as best as I can tell, um, the, it ended up being a fairly comprehensive proposal, and they had done um, some um, surveying and some analysis across the different units on campus, so that's one of the reasons how they knew what to ask. And then they had also done landscape analyses outside of the campus to look at basically what was on the horizon um, and what they uh, expected to be, be coming up. Um, so that's, I think, basically how they, they developed the ask. I do know, you know, just from various documents at the scene, they certainly went through a lot of iteration, iteration uh, about what they ask, and there were even some open questions, you know, at the time. You know, for example, I had mentioned something about uh, uh, how the storage was going to work were things that had to be kind of worked out um, still at that point. Um, is that 
kind of cover everything, or was there anything more specific that people were curious about? Yeah, if, if there's more things, I will have folks put that in the chat, and then sure. maybe it'll see if that develops. And Chris, do you have any other sort of comments as a, a follow-up, too? Thanks, Monica. We have um, done some initial work with talking um, to the Office of Research and our campus IT department. Um, so we think that the library and those two groups would be the main groups that would be involved with going uh, sustainability of funding. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's anything currently on the horizon for getting together with them. Um, Fernando, do you know? Uh, that's kind of been put on hold. Um, you know, we we did have a an initial plan, but with COVID, you know, things changed. So we're kind of reevaluating how how we're going to approach that. But that's kind of still the direction that we're trying to move in. Okay, and and um, we have a question here from Valerie Polichar at UCSD asking. Um, to both questions, but for, to both groups, both Heidi in particular. So Heidi, we'll start with you. What are the positions or roles of people in the research office that you work most closely with? Uh, and, and you might, um, and she says, essentially, where in the org chart did the connections occur? And um, I would actually also add to this question for you to think back in time and also to think about the relationships now, because I wonder if there may be some drift. And Sarah, if you want to answer anything in the chat, you may have some comments too, since you were there at sort of the, the origin of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. I can start or start now um, uh, for what how those relationships have been. In terms of kind of, you know, day-to-day -day relationships, we work most frequently with the person who um, is deemed sort of the, the, the chief of staff. So she's, uh, this is uh, Melanie Lutz, and she's basically, you know, functions as a deputy to the, to the vice chancellor for research. She's sort of a clearinghouse. She's amazing. Everybody knows her. She's incredibly diplomatic. And so a lot of things just get cued to her. And so, she, you know, she does a lot of um, kind of, um, you know, just routing uh, of those sorts of things. Um, so she's probably the person that we work most frequently uh, with. But there's several other positions that we work with really regularly. And I think for anybody who you know is doing this sort of work, you find that um, what services you offer are in different parts of the research cycle. Um, so we work with our grants and contracts unit quite a bit because of the data management plans, and that's also where the data transfers are agreements. So there's um, a chancellor for research who's over um, sponsored projects. So we work with him uh, relatively frequently. And then the same thing we have, uh, there's a um, vice chancellor for research for compliance. And so that's another area and that's where our IB is. So we work with him as well. And then finally, I'm afraid I don't know her exact title, but I believe she talked um, for uh, uh, for an OCLC uh, uh, webinar a few, a few months ago, is the their director of communications, um, who uh, you know, is another point person where we are really you know, try to collaborate to make sure that we're mutually pushing out information from each one of our units to, to to um to, to to stay visible these you know our campuses are just so large it's really really hard to get that communication out so those are the those are the people that we work most with okay and let me quickly before I turn it over to Chris to answer this is that we'll I'm one of the put into chat a link to well oh thanks uh, we'll share that link when you get the email about the recordings uh, because yes she did present and it's useful to talk think about the relationships there so Chris yeah she's amazing. Um, okay, so um, the slide um, that was titled Conclusion, it did have the people that we've worked mostly with, um, although sometimes the titles can be a little confusing. <laughs> so one is a, there's a, in the Office of Research, there's a Vice President of Research Operations who we've done some work with, I believe, that um, people in the library at a higher level like our department head and maybe Sarah Shrees has worked more closely with Sangeeta. Um, also, the um, we've worked quite a bit with the second um, title that's listed, the Assistant VP of Research Intelligence. We've worked with quite a bit um, over the years and she, um, Lori Schultz, and she's actually the one that we've worked quite a bit with when we've um, when the campus has developing 
has developed a response to the um, the RFIs that have come out, most um, like from NIH, and then there were a couple others that came out, I think this past year, related to data repositories. So we've worked really close with her on that. And also discussions about how to integrate um, the library's research data management services more into the workflow of when faculty are applying for grants. And then the Assistant VP of Research Development, there's a unit called Research Development Services, but the unit that helps um, faculty and researchers develop grant proposals. And so uh, referrals back to us for um, data management services really comes from, um, comes from her unit. And also um, the workshops, the responsible conduct of research workshops, those are Fernando now, I'm not sure what unit, um, overall unit that comes from. Um, there's a training unit. Um, I don't I don't think that's Kim's group, but so that's sort of another um, unit over in the Office of Research that we work closely with. Thanks. And I think then Marilee will conclude us. Yeah. Um, I want to thank. Thank everybody uh, very much for your participation, especially our presenters, um, and especially uh, for those of you who endured uh, some of the audio issues that we encountered. I think that those more or less straighten themselves out. Um, I will double check the quality on the recording uh, before we send out the link to you all. But I want to thank you uh, very much for joining us today, and we'll, we'll be posting a recording of the webinar today, along with all the links that were shared uh, uh, reference to other webinars that we've done that relate to this one. Um, so thank you once again for joining us, and this concludes today's webinar.